was Charlie was looking out the window. He was trying to figure out what to do. Saw the light flicker on the mountain again. They had gone up the mountain. They had encountered terrible Tim. And now what would they do? Charlie began to think, you know, maybe we should go back. Maybe we should go back and be a witness to terrible Tim. That kind of scared him. The thought of going back up to that shack and getting close to the door and him popping out the door again, that kind of scared him. And the more he thought about it, the more he said, that's what we should do. Preston and Red had not quite gone to sleep yet. And he said, hey guys, I got an idea. And they said, sure, what is it? They thought maybe they're going to play some sort of game the next day or some adventure. He says, I think we need to go to the top of the mountain. I think we need to go and share the gospel with Terrible Tim. Now, Red was a guy that, he liked adventure, but he liked it to be safe. And he says, no way, no way. The president said, what do you mean? He says, I think we need to go up there. I've got in my Bible that I picked up Sunday some tracks. And those tracks are little booklets that talk about God and Jesus and why Jesus came. And I think we ought to take some up there and leave them with them. Preston began to think, hmm, that's not a bad idea. How are we going to do it? Red said, I think it's a bad idea. I don't know how we're going to do it. They began to talk back and forth. And Charlie says, who will go with me? Will you go? Preston reluctantly said, yes, I'll go with you, but I'm not sure about this. Red said, I'll go with you, but I think it's a totally bad idea. And they settled on it. That the next morning, they would get up, and they would go back to the top of the mountain, to shadow leg, just almost to the top, and see if they could get up to the cabin and put those tracks where terrible Tim would see them. Well, it took a while for the boys to drift off to sleep because they were thinking about that adventure they were going to encounter the next day. But they finally dozed off. Charlie was awoken again the next morning by that same crow and that same rooster. Up he got. He said, guys, let's go. We've got chores to do. Grandpa's already been up for two or three hours. Hurry. So the boys got up and they got dressed and down the stairs and down the long hallway they went. They could hear someone singing in the kitchen and it Suge, she had him another delicious breakfast ready. This time she had bacon. She had fresh eggs, orange juice and milk. Oh, and some biscuits to go with it, with gravy. The boys ate as much as they could, and off they went out the screen door on the back of the house, across the porch and down the path to the barn where Grandpa was already milking the cow, feeding the chickens, and they joined in. After the boys had finished all the chores, everything was put up. They told Grandpa, Grandpa, we're going back up to the mountain. He said, well, be careful, boys. He wasn't quite sure what their plan was. They really hadn't told him, but off they went. They crossed over the pasture. They came by the pond and then to the edge of the mountain where the woods began to get deep and dark. And they said, hey, let's go. And up they went fast as they could go. They got all the way up to the path that they had found the day before. When they got to the path, they said, hey, now's the time for us to be kind of quiet and go slowly. But as they said that, they all glanced up and up above them, up the path, same place as it was yesterday, there that tree was with that hole in it where the limb had broke and it rotted out slightly and created a little shelf there. And they saw another package wrapped in brown paper, wrapped with a string, and the boys hurried up to it. Charlie reached in and grabbed it. Quickly, he untied the brown string and opened up the brown paper. And there inside this package was the carving of a small beaver. You could see the beaver's fur, its tail, and even its two big front teeth. It was really finely carved. And the boys looked at one another and said, how could this be? Who could have done this? 
they were just, they just didn't understand. They said, hurry though, we've got to go. So they began to go up the trail. As they went up the trail, they said, we've got to be really quiet. They slowed down. As they walked through the leaves now off of the trail a little bit, because they shifted just a little bit away from where they were the day before. The leaves began to make a, just a, a deafening, crunching noise. It was, they were trying to be quiet, but, and the leaves weren't that loud, but it seemed like it was loud because they were trying to be as quiet as they could. And they crunched and crunched, and all of a sudden, Red stepped on a twig and it popped. The boys froze, thinking that door was going to fly open any moment, but it didn't. The closer they got, they almost got to the stairs. And when they got almost to the stairs, all of a sudden, the door flew open again. And standing in the door, was the biggest man they had ever seen. His hair was black and bushy. His beard was black. His shirt was red and black. He had jeans on with logging boots all the way up to his knees, muscles bulging out of those that shirt he had on, and he looked at the boys and he pointed at them and says, Boys, don't you ever come back to this mountain again, or I'm going to... And before he could finish the sentence, three boys turned and ran as fast as they could down the trail, going as fast as they could, past the tree with the hole in it, and then down the mountain they went. And when they felt they had got far enough away, they stopped and took a breather. Red said, I told you, I told you, I told you, it was a bad idea. It was a bad idea. I told you. Preston says, it wasn't too bad of an idea, but we sure didn't do it. We... And Charlie began to rub his head. He always rubbed his head when he was a little worried or a little frustrated. And he was rubbing his head and he says, oh my, we didn't even leave the tracks. That was what was on Charlie's mind. He says, we didn't, oh man, we have failed again. What of it? Charlie was heartbroken. Preston put his arm around and said, it's okay, man. It's all right. Come on, we've got to get back. And off the boys went down the mountain. As they came to the edge of the mountain, stepped out into the pasture, past the pond, and then across to the fence that opened into the barn. They went around the barn to the house. They didn't say anything to one another. They were just quiet, disappointed, scared, thankful that they were safe. All of a sudden, they hear a voice, and it was Grandpa. And Grandpa said, let's go, boys. We're going to town. Charlie loved to go to town. Grandpa drove around his pickup truck. It was a Chevrolet stepside pickup truck. All the boys jumped in the back. The back of it smelt like a mixture of corn, leather, diesel fuel, a little rust, and a lot of dust. It was perfect. And they all sat on stuff, wiggled their ways around and found a place to sit, and off down the gravel road they went to town. As they came to town, they passed a few things, the old post office, they passed the bank, they passed the five and dime store, they passed the little market, they passed Mr. Jones's barber shop. And he pulled up to the general store and he said, boys, y'all can go inside. I'm going to go over to the bank and take care of some business. I'll be back in a few minutes. Now, Charlie loved to go to the general store. As he walked up to it, you could see inside and, oh my goodness, it was full of stuff. He opened the door. As he opened the door, there's a bell on the back. And it would ring every time someone would walk in. And the gentleman behind the Mr. Smith behind the counter would always welcome with a hearty come on in and they did and there as they walked in they looked around the ceiling was high it was had a design in it Charlie knew because he had asked his grandpa years ago he said what's that design he said it's made out of tin and it looked like kind of like flowers and vines and all kinds of things and it had a big fan hanging down with some lights coming down off a wire with a bulb and as they looked around again a little further, the walls were filled with shelves. And on those shelves, there were canned food. There was uh, tools. There were school supplies. But the section that Charlie liked the most was near the counter. 
and it was lined with jars of all types of candy. Gumdrops, sour drops, oh man, bubble gum, atomic fireballs. Everything a kid could want was right there in those jars. And on the end of that counter was a big bag of flour. Next to the flour was a big barrel, about the size of that barrel over there, filled with sour pickles. And if you wanted a good sour pickle, you could go over there in that, lift it up, reach your tongue, a little stick type thing in it, grab you a big sour pickle, put it back, and buy it for five cents. Well, all of a sudden, as they were looking at the big pickle barrel, Red said, I bet that's what Terrible Tim eats all the time boys kind of chuckled and laughed, but all of a sudden, behind them, they heard the bell ring on the door. They turned around, thinking it was probably Grandpa coming through the door, but no, it was Terrible Tim. The boys went around the barrel as quick as they could, dove on the floor, and were quiet as did say a word. Tim walked over to Mr. Smith and said, in a very deep and growling voice, let me see your knives boys behind the barrel looked at one another. Charlie could feel that Preston and Red were shaking a little bit. And he was shaking too. They glanced around the barrel and there Terrible Tim was looking at knives and taking his thumb and rubbing them across them. And he'd look at Mr. Smith and said, no, not that one. But finally he handed him a knife. It was a Barlow. A Barlow knife three-inch blade. He rubbed his thumb across it and it was sharp. And he had kind of a halfway grin. And he looked at Mr. Smith and said, I'll take it. Reached in his pocket, pulled out a couple dollars and paid for it, got his change, walked out the store. The doorbell rang as he left. And he was gone. Charlie, Preston, and Red looked at one another and said, I wonder, that's all they had to say. They couldn't believe what they'd seen. Just then, Grandpa came in the store. And he hollered from, boys, where are you? Let's go, it's time to go. And they stood up. He said, what have y'all been doing? He said, come over here, pick you out a piece of candy. So they all went down through there and searched for the right piece of candy. Grandpa paid for it, and off the boys went. They jumped back into the pickup truck, smelling like dust, diesel, rust, and leather, and off they went. It was a great ride back home. It was cool. And when they got home, they had a delicious supper. Suge had prepared for them. But it was Wednesday. And on Wednesday, Grandpa always went with Suge to church. And during the summer, they didn't have any special type of services program, just the minister would get up in the front of the church and he'd teach a little Bible study. Well, tonight, the boys came in with Grandpa and Suge and they sat on the front row and the Bible study was about the man by the name of Paul. And the minister, Mr. Thompson, said, boys, girls, men and women, I want to tell you about Paul. And so he began to trace back through the life of Paul, the apostle. And he talked about his conversion, that before he came to know Christ, his name was Saul. And on his way to Damascus, where he was going to capture and persecute Christians, it says a great light shone on Saul. And the Lord opened up his heart and his eyes, and he came to Christ. His name then was changed to Paul. He spent some time in Damascus, but because he was such a bold witness, he had to escape. And Paul was let down over a wall in a basket so he could escape and get away. He said, Paul, you've got to understand, when he came to Christ, the only thing he could think about was sharing the message of Christ. That's what captivated his heart, and he was bold and fearless to share the gospel. He said another time, Paul was taken out of the city after he had shared Christ, and they stoned him. They threw rocks at him. And thinking he was dead, they left him. But he was not dead. 
God was not finished with Paul yet. He still had work for Paul to do. still had opportunities for Paul to teach and to share Christ. Another time they find Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas had got thrown into jail when they were in Philippi. And when they went to jail, they didn't complain. They didn't worry. They weren't anxious. But as they were chained in jail, they began to sing and praise God. And a miraculous thing happened. It says the jail shook, the doors opened, the chains fell off. The guard that was keeping them thinking everybody had just left and escaped, looked around and everybody was still there. And Paul said, we're still here. Don't you worry. That day, the Bible tells us that the jailer came to know Christ through the witness of Paul and Silas. How did he come? I bet you he heard the songs. I bet you he heard the conversation. I bet you they heard the praising and singing to God and being thankful for even being in the prison. It says the jailer and his whole family came to Christ. See, Paul's life was a life of boldness and witness to whomever he came across. He witnessed the kings, and he witnessed to those on the road. He witnessed the families. He was a bold witness all the time. Now, Charlie began to think, Minister Pastor Thompson was speaking, says, man, I'd like to be like that. He says, but I'm even scared to go back up and put tracks at Terrible Tim's house. Hmm, that really troubled him. What would he do? Mr. Thompson says, you know, there's a couple things that prevent us from being a witness like Paul. He says, some of us, let's, let's just compare it to a farmer. A farmer has a tough life. He goes out and sows seed, and that's how we share the gospel. We sow the seed. But you know, there are weeds that come up. He says there are weeds that come up in our life personally. You know what? Pastor Thompson said, one of the weeds that's in my life that I struggle the most with is pride. And my pride often keeps me from sharing the gospel. He says another is doubt. I wonder sometimes about, am I really saved? Is this really true? Does God really exist? There are weeds that choke them out. He says there's other things. There's, uh, uh, maybe it's Satan. Maybe it's Satan who comes and takes that gospel. Maybe we tell somebody about Christ, but that person just turns away. They're not interested at all. Well, he says also, there's a, bad weather that comes across sometimes. You know, sometimes the bad weather comes, the wind and the hail, and it destroys the crop. He says sometimes we fear. We fear because we don't have faith in God that he's going to go before us and prepare that person to hear the gospel. He says we have to have faith. Our fear often, it comes in our mind and says, you won't have the right words. Or you might say something that would discourage them to come into Christ. See, we begin to take more responsibility than we should, thinking that we are the ones that save them. We're the ones that make them come to Christ. No, we're just the messenger that shares the truth, and the Spirit brings them to Christ. Mm. Charlie was just shaking his head. Yes, that's right. Well, they sing a song before they left. One of Charlie's favorite, In My Heart There Rings a Melody. And off they went. Got back home that night. The boys uh, had a little snack, some little leftover brownies that they had at lunch. With a nice cold glass of milk. They went down the hallway and up the stairs. As they got up the stairs, got into bed, Charlie began to think. And he said, What is God going to do? Well, how does he want me to be a witness? And he drifted off to sleep. The next day, it went by fast. After lunch, Charlie began to think, we need to go to the mountain. 
So he gets the boys together after lunch, and they were just playing around the barn. He says, guys, I still have these tracks in my pants, in my pocket. I think we need to go up the mountain. Red looked at him and says, or have you lost your mind? Preston says, what are you talking about? We've already did that. Do you really want to do that again? Why would we want to do that? He said, did you hear what Pastor Thompson said last night? He talked about how we should be bold. We should not fear. We should understand God is the one that goes before us. Preston says, I don't know, Charlie. Uh, we tried once, he says, but let's go try again. Preston kind of thought through it and he says, I'll tell you what, I'll go if Red will go. And Red looked at him and says, what? He says, I'll go if Red will go. Red says, this is crazy. But Red agreed. And off the boys went. They didn't go back to the house and tell anybody where they were going. They just took off. They got to the pond, they got to the edge of the mountain where the woods were dark and deep, and they just ran up the mountain. As they were going to the mountain, they knew they were getting pretty close to the path. They had decided that their strategy was, we'll go behind the cabin this time, sneak around the side real quietly, reach over and set the tracks on the porch next to the door, and then leave. That way he won't see us coming. The closer they got to the path, faster they were running and the faster their heart was going. They climbed and they climbed and they took a deep breath and they stopped for just a moment and all of a sudden they heard a sound that they had never heard before. It was the sound of a rattlesnake. They remembered that Grandpa and their dad had told them to be careful of rattlesnakes on Shadow Mountain. As soon as the boys heard that, Charlie says, we better get out of here. Let's go quick. And down the mountain, they started to go. They had only gone about maybe 40 or 50 feet, and Charlie stepped in a hole as they ran down the mountain. When he stepped in that hole, he fell forward and screamed with pain. The boys came back to find out what happened. And when they came back, they found Charlie on the ground holding his leg. And they said, what's the matter? He says, I think I, I, hurt my, I might have broke my leg or something. And he was crying because of all the pain. They said, what are we going to do? Red said, I'll tell you what, I'll go, I'll go. I'll, he was too excited. I'll go, I'll go. He said, Preston said, no, 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 I'll go. Probably looked at both of them and says, both of you go. In case you get lost, y'all can help each other. You need to go together. I'll be okay for a few minutes. So the boys took off. Down, he could hear them going through the leaves as quick as they could, down the mountain, talking a little bit as they went. And finally, they got out a distance where he couldn't hear them anymore. And they were gone. Charlie was laying on the ground, and he scooted himself up against the stump and kind of put his head so he could relax a little bit. And he was crying, and the pain was just throbbing in his leg. And he finally just kind of got himself composed and settled down a little bit. And as he was laying on the log, he heard a sound. And he turned around, and coming through the leaves, just a few feet away, and tomorrow, 